from Vermont. Well, Mr. President, as uh, someone who travels around this country, I am always amazed by the huge disconnect that exists between what we do here in Congress and what the American people want us to do. The simple truth is, as poll after poll has shown, is that Congress is way out of touch as to where the American people are. Let me just give you a few examples before I get to the thrust of my remarks. Many of my Republican colleagues are still talking about cutting Social Security, a disastrous idea. But according to a recent NBC News Wall Street Journal poll, by a three to one margin, the American people want us to expand Social Security benefits, not cut them. How out of touch can one be? The same poll told us, this is a poll about two weeks ago, is that while there is virtually no Republican in the Senate who is prepared to support raising the minimum wage to 10 10 an hour, what the American people want by a pretty solid majority is not to raise the minimum wage to 10 10 an hour, but to raise the minimum wage to $15 an hour, something that is occurring now in Los Angeles, Seattle, and other places around the country. Tragically, this Congress is way out of touch with the American people on issue after issue, and it is high time that we started to get our act together and to respond to the needs, the pressing needs, of the American people. Mr. President, between 1985 and 2013, there was a huge redistribution of wealth in America. And I know my Republican colleagues get very, very nervous when people talk about wealth distribution. Well, guess what? Over the last 30 years, we have had a huge degree of distribution of wealth in America. Unfortunately, that redistribution went in the wrong direction. That redistribution went to the tune of trillions of dollars from the pockets of the middle class and working families of our country into the hands of the top one-tenth of one percent. So if you want to understand economics in the last 30 years, middle class shrinks, top one-tenth of one percent doubles the percentage of wealth that it owns. Today, Mr. President, the United States has more wealth and income inequality than any other major industrialized country on earth. The top one-tenth of one percent now owns 22 percent of all the wealth in this country, while the bottom 90 percent owns 22.8 percent. In other words, the top one-tenth of one percent owns almost as much wealth as the bottom 90 percent, and the trend is toward more and more wealth and income inequality. That is the economic reality that we're looking at now. But let me talk for a moment about another reality that saddens me very much and that we cannot continue to ignore. We are the wealthiest country in the history of the world, and yet we have the highest rate of childhood poverty of any major industrialized nation on earth with almost 20 percent of our kids living in poverty. In recent years, we have seen a proliferation of millionaires and billionaires in this country, yet over 50 percent of the children in our public schools are so low income that they are eligible for the free or reduced price school lunch program. Mr. President, as a result of the collapse of the American middle class over the last 40 years, men and women in this country are working longer and longer hours in order to cobble together enough income to sustain their families. And yet, while over 85 percent of male workers are working more than 40 hours a week, while over 66 percent 
of working women are working more than 40 hours a week. We have a dysfunctional child care system which denies millions of working families the ability to secure high quality and affordable child care. Mr. President, I just uh, last week spoke to a woman who lives right here in Washington, D.C., and she told me that to get her one-year-old child into quality daycare here in the nation's capital, she and her husband are spending close to $30,000 a year for one child. Now, D.C. child care is probably more expensive than other parts of the country, but millions of parents are struggling with child care bills of fifteen, twenty, twenty-five thousand dollars a year when their income is thirty, forty, fifty thousand dollars a year. And if you have two young kids, I just don't know how you manage. Mr. President, the truth of the matter is that while working families are desperately trying to find quality child care at an affordable cost, we are turning our backs on those families. The result, millions of children in this country are not receiving the quality child care or early education that they need when the psychologists tell us, tell, psychologists tell us that zero to four are the most important years of a human being's life in terms of intellectual and emotional development. What sense is that that we ignore the needs of millions of working families and their children? What sense is it to tell working moms and dads that they cannot get the quality and affordable child care they need? What sense is it to send many children into kindergarten and first grade already far, far behind where they should be intellectually because they had inadequate childcare. This is not what a great country is supposed to be about. When we talk about the future of America, we cannot be talking about turning our backs on the children of this country. And that is why we should be doing in this country what nations all over the world have done, and that is invest in our kids and move toward a universal pre-K education system for all of our children. Mr. President, I am glad that the Elementary and Secondary Education Act is on the floor right now for debate. And I want to thank Senator Murray and Senator Alexander for their hard work on this important bill. In Vermont and around this country, and I've had town meetings on this issue in Vermont, hundreds of teachers, parents, kids come out. They understand that no child left behind has failed, and what we are doing now begins to address that failure and move us in a very different direction. Mr. President, when we talk about the needs of young people, something, by the way, that we very rarely do, we should understand that it's not just that we have a dysfunctional child care and pre-K system, which must be significantly improved, it is not just that no child le left behind must be reformed. It is not just that a college education is now unaffordable for millions of working class and low income families. All of those are terribly important issues that we must address. But I hope very much there is another issue that we will finally start to pay attention to. And this country, this Senate, the House of Representatives must come to grips with the fact that today in America we have a horrendous, horrendous level of youth unemployment in this country. This is an issue which gets 
virtually no discussion at all. This is an issue of crisis proportions that we are not addressing. For the future of this country, not to mention the future lives of millions of our young people, we cannot continue to sweep the issue of youth unemployment under the rug. Last month, the Economic Policy Institute released a new study about the level of youth unemployment in this country. And what they found should concern every member of the Congress and, in fact, every person in our country. The Economic Policy Institute analyzed census data on unemployment among young people who are jobless, who have no jobs, those who are working part-time when they want to work full-time, and those who have given up looking for work altogether. And this is what they found. From April of 2014 to March of 2015, a one-year period, the average real unemployment rate for young white high school graduates between the ages of 17 and 20 was 33.8 percent. The jobless rate for Hispanics in the same age group was 36.1 percent. And unbelievably, the average real unemployment rate for black high school graduates and those who dropped out of high school was 51.3 percent. 51.3 percent. Mr. President, I would ask a unanimous consent to insert the EPI's findings into the record. Without objection. Mr. President, today in our country, over five and a half million young people have either dropped out of high school or have graduated high school and do not have jobs. It is no great secret to anyone that without work, without education, and without hope, people get into trouble. They get into destructive activity or self-destructive activity. And the result of all of that, Mr. President, is that tragically, here in the United States today, we have more people in jail than any other country on Earth. We have more people in jail than an authoritarian communist country, China, with a population of over three times our population. Tonight, today, the United States represents 4% of the world's population, yet we have 22% of the world's prisoners. Incredibly, over 3% of our country's population is under some form of correctional control. According to the NAACP, from 1980 to 2012, the number of people incarcerated in America quadrupled, quadrupled from roughly 500,000 to over 2 million people. Mr. President, a study published in the journal Crime and Delinquency found, and this is really quite unbelievable and quite tragic, that almost half of black males in the United States are arrested by the age of 23. And if current trends continue, one in four black males born today can expect to spend time in prison during his lifetime. This is an unspeakable tragedy. It is something we cannot continue to ignore. But this crisis is not just a destruction of human life. It is also very, very costly to the taxpayers of our country. Locking people up in jail is a very expensive proposition. In America, we now spend nearly $200 billion on public safety, including $70 billion a year on correctional facilities. $70 billion a year on correctional facilities. Mr. President, it is beyond comprehension that we as a nation 
have not focused attention on the fact that millions of young people are unable to find work and begin their adult lives in a productive way. We cannot, cannot, cannot continue to turn our backs on this national tragedy. Let me be very clear, and I think I speak for the vast majority of people in this country, and I hope the majority of members in the United States Senate. It makes a lot more sense for us to be investing in jobs and in education to be, spend, to be spending billions of dollars on jails and incarceration. Mr. President, we have got to start creating a situation where our kids can leave school and lead productive lives, not have them arrested and incarcerated. Mr. President, I have introduced legislation along with Representative John Conyers in the House that would provide five and a half billion dollars in immediate funding to states and cities throughout this country to employ one million young Americans between the ages of 16 and 24 and to provide job training opportunities to young adults. Now some people may say, well, five and a half billion dollars is a lot of money. It is. But it is a lot less expensive to provide jobs and education to our young people than to lock them up and to destroy their lives. Mr. President, as we debate uh, ESEA, and again I want to thank uh, Senators Murray and Alexander for their important work, I want this issue to be on the table. And I intend to offer an amendment that says in this country we're going to put our young people to work, we're going to get them an education rather than locking them up. And with that, uh, Mr. President, I would yield.